Hi there and welcome to Living by Faith where we are building faith for faithful living. I am Donnie DeBoard and I am honored to be able to study the Bible with you for just a few moments. One of the things that we struggle with in our day to day life is hope. Many times we can really get beat down by the things going on around us. We've got family problems, we have financial problems, we have emotional problems and it can be easy just to give up. Many times people give up on the church, they give up on their ministry, they give up on their families or their children, they give up on their marriage. But I want to encourage you today to never give up, to never, never give up, but to always cling to the hope that we have because of Jesus. Our text for today will be from Hebrews chapter 7. And here in Hebrews chapter 7 we have this wonderful display of the greatness and superiority of Christ. But much more than that, we also see that we have reason to hope because of our Christ. We see here in Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, And as much as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn, and he will not relent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has been become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once, for all when he offered up himself. That is our great high priest and the hope that we have in God. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Our Father, we are grateful for our great high priest that continues to make intercession for us, that is our great mediator. Father, we are grateful for the wonderful expression of your love, for your tender mercy that flows from his side. Father, we pray that you will bless us in our study today and fill us with the hope of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll free at 888-805-3390. In the book of Hebrews, we see this beautiful expression of Christian hope. It is written to second generation Christians who are thinking about giving up. They were thinking about turning aside. But the entire book of Hebrews is written to encourage them to hang on to Christ and to Christianity because Jesus is better. Over and over again throughout this book, we see that Jesus is better. And here in Hebrews chapter 7, well actually going back to verse 19 of chapter 6, we're going to see that Jesus is this better hope that we should never give up because Jesus is the best hope that we can find. And so we look here in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 and the Bible tells us that this hope, this hope that only Jesus can offer, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become the high priest forever according to the order of of Melchizedek. Now we look here at what Jesus has done. First of all, He has given us this anchor. That anchor is what keeps you grounded. And in fact, one of the earliest Christian symbols that we see throughout uh, the archaeological digs is that of an anchor. Perhaps you are familiar with the little fish that is supposed to be representative of Christianity. But even before that, predating it, is the uh, the anchor, the symbol of the anchor, and this is where it comes from, that anchor of the soul, that which keeps us grounded, that which gives us uh, foundation. Here that hope has been supplied by Christ and that anchor is sure and steadfast. There is no wavering in it. There is no doubting in the blessings of Christianity. That anchor of the soul, this hope that God gives is both sure and steadfast. There is nothing to doubt in Him. And this is made possible because Jesus has gone into this most holy place, not the most holy place of the temple, but into heaven itself, not the pattern that was there on earth during the days of Christ, the temple of the Jews, but He has gone into heaven itself and is now interceding for us. And so this Jesus has entered in and brought that hope there right before God where He serves as the high priest. He serves as this intercessor, this mediator between God and man, the one that has offered not sacrifices of bulls and goats and lambs and other such things, but the one that has sacrificed His own body. Therefore He is the greatest high priest making uh, that one sacrifice for all people, making it as final as death, the book of Hebrews would tell us that his sacrifice was just as effective, just as lasting as it is appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. So Jesus has died once, a sacrifice for sins. But we also see that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And this is a priesthood that is superior to the Levitical system, that which is there in Jerusalem. And we'll study about that for just a moment. But our main focus for the preamble of chapter 7 is Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. And it is this hope that we need to hang on to Christ. The hope that we have that is in Christianity. We cannot abandon the greatest thing that we've got going, this expectation of being with God forever, the expectation of having the forgiveness of our sins, the certainty that only Jesus Supplies. We cannot abandon it because Jesus is best, because His way is best. And here in chapter 7 we see why His way is best, how it is that we know that this is the great hope. You know in the book of Acts we read that there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. And that is the expectation and the certainty that we have in Christ. And this is why we believe that here in Hebrews chapter 7. First of all, we see that Christ and His way is better than the old patriarchal system. Now in the Bible, I know that you are familiar that there are three systems. We call them the patriarchal system, the mosaic system, and then the Christian system. The patriarchal system began as God spoke to the fathers. He spoke to the patriarchs. And this continued for the Jews up until Matthew. Mount Sinai when God delivered the law and the law of Moses or the Levitical system 
was in fact for the Jews from Sinai to Calvary. The patriarchal system, we suppose, continued for the Gentiles from Adam all the way up until Calvary. But at Calvary, both these systems were taken away. At Calvary, there is this new and living way by which all people are invited to God and all people are accountable to God. But Jesus is better even than the patriarchal system. We think about that wonderful opportunity that Adam and Eve had there in the garden as they were accustomed to hearing God walk in the cool of the morning. And Christianity is even better than that. He, he says and demonstrates it this way. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father or mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now Abraham is here really serving under the patriarchal system. The law of Moses has not come into effect yet. He is serving under the system of God speaking through the fathers. And Abraham is the great patriarch, the great father of the faithful. But even Abraham was subservient. He was uh, inferior to the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now we don't know much about this man Melchizedek. We read about him back in Psalm 110 verse 4 and in the book of Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 through 20 that we read about here and then also in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 10 and then here in chapter 7. But really is a mysterious character. But in so many ways he foreshadows the priesthood of Christ. First of all, we see that his name Melchizedek from two Greek words, Melech meaning king and Zedek meaning righteousness. He is king of Salem, king of Jerusalem, but he is also the priest of the Most High God. And this royal priesthood is the priesthood in which Christ serves in as well. We read in verse 3 some more similarities between Melchizedek and Christ. We see that he was without father or mother or genealogy. Now, not literally for Melchizedek. He had a mother and father and a genealogy, but no one knew what it was. And so this mysterious figure just bursts upon the scene and no one knows where he came from. No one knows where he came from. And it's the same way with Christ in that he is eternal. He has no literal mother and father. He inhabited eternity with God and is now in eternity with God again, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Same way with Christ. Although it was a figurative saying concerning Melchizedek, it is literal with Christ that He has no beginning and no end, that He is eternal just like God the Father. And in that way remains the priest continually. He's not like the other priests that went through their rotations. They were able to serve twice a year uh, during the days of Christ and then again on the uh, feast days. But Jesus is a priest continually. He was always there making intercession for the saints. He always lives to do this. And in this way, Jesus is better than that patriarchal system that Abraham understood and lived in. Now, it is truly amazing that anyone would want to go back to that when we have something better. Even though we see God walking in the cool of the morning and God speaking directly to people, the Bible is telling us that Jesus and Christianity is greater than all those things. But then secondly, Christ and Christianity is also better than the Levitical system. And this is the main thrust of our chapter and also the main thrust of the book of Hebrews. As we read here in verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils, or he gave a tithe. And it was customary for inferior people to tithe to those that were superior to them as a show of their allegiance and their submission to them. And indeed those who are of the sons of Levi, who had not yet been born, but were the priesthood of the Levitical system, the Mosaic system, those who were the sons of Levi received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed them who had the promises in verse 6. Now, the Jewish people base all of their pride and their certainty upon their genealogy, upon their family history going back to Abraham. But here this one Melchizedek, who has no genealogy, is superior in his priesthood, in his reign, in his service, 
and he doesn't even know, he doesn't even have this genealogy. We can't trace him back. And so he is going back to a superior form of service. Then a way, this is saying that Jesus, who is following in this priesthood of Melchizedek, is superior to the old covenant. He is superior to the Mosaic system. And he says in verse 7, Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. It was Melchizedek that blessed Abraham. And they were going back to Abraham, these Jewish individuals, saying he is the great father of the faithful. He is our hope. But it wasn't that way. Abraham tithed unto Melchizedek, and it was Melchizedek that blessed Abraham. In the same way, we should be serving Christ, and it is Christ who blesses us. We see here in verse 9, Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. In other words, Abraham served as the representative of the entirety of both the patriarchal and Mosaic system. As Levi was still yet in his loins, so to speak, as he was the great, great, great grandfather, as he is the predecessor but the representative of the Jewish people. He is saying that the Melchizedek priesthood, the Melchizedek uh, is greater in, uh, in uh, quality than his own uh, fashion or form that we have recorded for us throughout the Old Testament. Now the purpose of this is so that we can understand that Christianity, following in the line of Melchizedek, this kingly priest role, is superior both to the patriarchal and to the Levitical system. Now, Having demonstrated that Jesus and Christianity is better than the patriarchal and Levitical system, he continues on here, beginning in verse 11 through the end of the chapter, to show us why Christ is best, to show us why Jesus is the best option. And we begin here in verse 11, and we see that Jesus is the best option because He offers perfection where nothing else can. He says in verse 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? You see, there had to be that change. No longer under the Old Testament, now under Christianity. But also we see that perfection was not available under the Old Testament. They were continually making those sacrifices. But not so with Christ. He has died once to make atonement for all people. He tasted death for every man. He suffered so that we might be freed. And that one sacrifice is great enough for all time. And so this completion, this maturity or perfection is available only through Christ. And so we read again in verse 12 that there is this change of law, that there is a new and better way. He says, For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also the change of law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident, seeing that our Lord arose from Judah, of which the tribe of Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And so there is this change of law that we see is necessitated because of the silence of the Scriptures. Many times the silence of the Scriptures is prohibitive. When God says something specifically that the priests are to come from the tribe of Levi, the sons of Aaron, that is the only place that we can find priest for God's service under the Old Testament. Whenever in the New Testament God specifies that we must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins, it's the only way it can happen. When He says that we are to sing and make melody in our hearts uh, in our worship services in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16, it's the only way it can happen because He has specified that. Being silent on everything else, it is excluded. In the same way, since the Bible is silent concerning a priest rising out of the Levitical, uh, out of any other tribe, other than the tribe of Levi, then it is impossible for there to be a priest unless he is from the tribe of Levi. Since Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi, there must be this change of law. And it is a better law. It is the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christianity in which we are blessed to serve. And in similar fashion, there is this better priest. In verse 15, the Bible says, And it is yet far more evident, if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. 
for he testifies. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek in Psalm 110 and verse 4. For on the one hand there is the annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. For the law being made nothing, made nothing perfect. But on the other hand there is this better hope. Why is it that Jesus is better? Better than anything else in the world? Better than anything you can imagine? Because of this better hope that we have through this better law, this better priesthood, through this best perfection, this better hope through which we draw near to God. Throughout the Old Testament, you could draw near to God through grace, but there was always boundaries. You can only go so far in the temple. There was the court of women. There was uh, the various places that you could go, and only the high priest only once a year could go in the most holy place. But through Christ, we have been brought near. Our hope has gone into that most holy place we sell there in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And so Jesus is the better hope through which we are able to draw nigh unto God. So many times we feel as though we are far away, as though we have uh, been neglected or forgotten. But through Christ, we can draw near to Him. We can draw near to the throne of grace and we can enjoy these wonderful blessings if only we will continue to trust in our Father and to hope in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we see continued in verse 20. Inasmuch as He was not made a priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see the importance that God places on the covenant of Christ. That is going to be an everlasting covenant. It's not going to be replaced. The old covenant was going to be replaced. It always was planned to be replaced. In Jeremiah 31, God told the people, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, but this new covenant that I will write on their hearts and all the people will know me. Isaiah said that in that day the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established and all people will say, come, let us walk in the light of Jehovah. That is what happened in Christ. It was because of the oath that God had sworn by Himself in making this better covenant. In verse 22, the Bible says, By so much more Jesus has become the surety or the guarantee, the down payment, the guarantor of this better covenant. He also says there were many priests because they prevented uh, by death from continuing, but He, because He continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. In verse 25, that is beautiful, isn't it? This word save, the Greek word soterion, has to do with healing, to bringing back, to binding back together. And that is what Jesus has done. Although we were enemies to God, He has reconciled us. He has made peace through the blood of His own cross, through His own sacrifice, through His own death. That is how we are saved. But He is able to save to the uttermost. Many times people will feel like they've done too much. They have sinned too greatly. And there is no way that God wants them. There's no way that they can be redeemed. There's no way that they can be helped. But God is able to save to the uttermost. We think about Peter, who three times denied the Lord. We think about Paul, who was the persecutor of the church, who became the great preacher of Christianity. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. There is no one so lost as that the blood of Christ cannot free them from that sin, that cannot save them. And that is the message that we are privileged to preach today, the great salvation that Jesus offers. And then he says he always lives to make intercession for them. This is his continued purpose. He always lives for this one thing, to reconcile you to God, to bring you back. This is his continued purpose. He never departs from it. And then in verse 26, we see that such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. That is the God that we serve. That's why Christianity is so great.
because it depends not upon the sacrifices that we can bring, but upon the sacrifice that Jesus made. I beg and plead with you to cling to that hope, to hold on to Christ, the expectation of heaven that only He offers. Thank you so very much. Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Hallelujah, find the glory, hallelujah. You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll free at 888-805-3390. I don't know of any greater privilege than to extend to you today the invitation of God. We understand just how much God loves us. The Bible tells us in John 3 and verse 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, that world through Him might be saved. That wonderful offer of salvation is extended to you today. God wants you to be saved. He is not willing that any should perish. He has demonstrated His great love for you and His desire for your salvation in sending His Son to die on the cross to make atonement for your sins by raising Him from the grave to show that great hope that we have in the resurrection as well. And by faith we receive these blessings when we respond to Him appropriately. We repent of our sins. Jesus says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In repentance we are turning away from living the way we want to live and completely submitting our lives to Christ. We are giving ourselves to Him, to His service entirely. But we must also be baptized into Christ, being immersed in water. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, these two things, repentance and baptism, are joined together. Peter said, Repent ye therefore, and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we fulfill these two commands, when we obey the Lord in this way, we receive these two promises. When God says that we should repent and be baptized, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of our sins there in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We understand that when we are baptized into Christ, this is the point in time in which God adds us to our, His family. In Galatians chapter 3, the Bible tells us that you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We understand this is how we become a Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 tells us, For by one Spirit you are all baptized into the one body. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, the Bible asks, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death, so that just as Jesus was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should be raised to walk in newness of life. For just as He was raised from the dead, we see it there in verse 5, we also will be raised from the dead, both a spiritual resurrection here in this life and a physical resurrection when He comes again to call His people home. Now this is the hope that we want to offer to you today, that you can turn from your sins, you can turn from being a slave to this world and become the servant of God. This is where the true blessings of life is. This is where the true joy of life is, is walking with your God and enjoying the great expectation of being called home to be with Him in heaven one day for all eternity. If we can help you to become a Christian, we would love to do that. We pray that you will contact us, that we may serve you in some way. If you would like to have a Bible correspondence course, we would love to share that with you for free, absolutely no obligation on your part. We just want to help you in your walk with God. Thank you so much for watching.